crops and um i mean ultimately it's just to sell their chemicals right but it goes deeper than that with like you know these terminator seeds you know where they prevent where the seeds are sterile and um things like that uh it's really taking all the power away from the farmer who traditionally has seed saved and giving it all to these corporations and to the scientists and the such and um you know, I just think it ultimately is that the people doing it are unhealthy people, so they're making unhealthy decisions. <laughs> what, what, and, do, uh, what do you think? I mean, did, did you manage to get into like the mindset of, of some of these people? And, and if so, I mean, uh, what would you say would define it? Why are these people going in this direction that is obviously going against uh, the laws of nature, if you will? You know what? Maybe a bit of a God complex. Uh, uh, you know, it's they're so div- divorced from... Uh, a living uh, conscious nature that they feel that it's to be to be bettered or improved and um you know i, I just think it's a, it's a problem you find in a lot of science everywhere these days and um, um and like i said I, i ultimately think it's a health a health issue you know that and it's projected in their work um you know if these people were balanced people they wouldn't be necessarily going about doing these things and um uh Because I'm yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm thinking about the fact as well that um, if you look at the kind of the basis of the of the scientific mindset, if you will, that that life actually itself is a coincidence, right? Where you know we're, we've evolved here, not nothing has a purpose or meaning. So they have a you know a mindset that actually is that everything around you uh, is not perfect and it can always be improved. You know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right, you know, and and. Uh, Oh, as I was going to say, it's uh, and it's you know it's really it's ridiculous because what's happened here in the prairies is it's you know this idea that it's the nature that can be compartmental like you know separated and compartmentalized and yes. and that you know controlled that way and um, it's just ridiculous and it's not it's not a science lab and um, there's definitely a, we need a definite revolution in the the science world right now. Do, do you think that uh, they will discover this uh, the hard way? I mean. As far as I'm, what I'm hoping for, I guess at this point is that uh, that they're gonna they're gonna keep trying, right? They're gonna try, you know, all the, all they got, right? But um, a matter of fact, I think they actually have nothing to put up against the force of nature, you know, in that regard. And, and nature always is going to win, no matter how big and tough these guys uh, think they are. What do you think about that? See, you know, it's interesting because um, if You know, following uh, one of the people I I interview and, and and connected with is Jeremy Narby, and his his whole thing is you know that the, the molecular world and the spirit world are the same thing, right? And so very much so, what scientists are talking about and shamans are talking about is the same thing. And so this started getting me thinking about what implications of genetic engineering and nanotechnology is, and it's ultimately you know perhaps it's an attempt to manipulate the spiritual world, right? Yes. You know, it's almost you know, it's supposed to be God, and and I would believe that you know that is you know our destiny to to you know be God and or we are God, and and that uh, now we just have to uh, uh, kind of catch up you know with that kind of behaving like God <laughs> and taking and risk techn- and Ta- responsible with this technology. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Responsibility. So I, yeah, and I do you know I do I do firmly believe that. And this is the big revelation that I keep coming back to: is that uh, you know, nature. The Monsanto scientists are still part of nature and are working for nature. And it might not be so obvious and clear right now because it's hard to get the big picture when you're just a simple human living this little life. But yes. in the grand scheme of things, that we are working towards something that has incredible purpose. A purpose that necessarily, these, I guarantee, these Monsanto sci- scientists are totally unaware of. But uh, I ultimately believe it's perhaps to get to a point where we can, you know, be responsible like God, yes. <laughs> and 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 uh, and genetically engineer these these plants for the betterment of the plants and for Earth and who knows what, you know. So, um, I, and, per, and perhaps that's the actual, the whole point of the plants wanting humans in the first place, right? Is or working with humans is to bring us to this point where we can do these things for them, right? Yes, uh, I mean, w- exactly, and that's. That's a good point, and I'm glad you mentioned it because it's a perspective that uh, isn't talked about too much, you know, in no. these circles, so to speak. And, and 
in regards to you know if you sit down and really think about it right what what actually is unnatural can you ever kind of uh dislocate yourself without you know uh, from without the environment of of you know planet earth you know you're still in the surrounding of nature all the time no matter how hard you try in a way and there's really nothing unnatural in that sense really going on so would you say that these scientists through the work that they're doing on one level they're actually on a on a learning curve to discover something greater Exactly. Totally. I mean, we're all globally on some amazing learning curve right now to learn that lesson, you know, so um, and from what I know and understand is, you know, it's a lesson that's we're learning really quickly. So I don't think I think this is all going to shift for the better sooner than later, actually. So sounds good. Especially. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, uh what more can can you say, or do you want to say something more about uh, in regards to to your first movie, Seeds of Change, and and then later on we can move on to talk about your other one, the real thing. But uh, is there anything more you you'd like to leave us with in regards to your first film? Well, no. I mean, beyond the fact that it, the name it's, itself was Seeds of Change, was very much the Seeds of Change for me personally, and um, uh, you know, it it uh, I'm involved with a, a project like an eco village being developed in the rural in a rural community and very much that was a product of that film and that whole um you know becoming aware to that world kind of thing so um yes yeah it's, it's very much part of that journey very very good and then uh, of course you can move on from there and talk about your other film the the real thing what what happened mm-hmm. there was that, that a natural progr- uh, natural progression so to speak and was that the the next project you had in mind at that point, or did it just pop out out of thin air? What happened? You know, I went to South America with a camera, a camera, looking for a story. Really, didn't know what I was going to do. Um, ended up at the World Social Forum in Porto Alegre, Brazil, and I saw a, a leader of the coca, a woman leader, Leonelda Zorita from the coca farmers, speak at the World Social Forum, and she basically pleaded. You know, eight or nine of her comrades had just been killed by the security forces in Bolivia, and she was like, you know, and she made mention to uh, the the guy that the anarchist that uh, died in Genoa, and she's like, you know, he became this martyr of the anti-globalization movement. She's like, you know, we've been fighting this movement for 500 years, and not, you know, eight of my guys just or friends just died, and no one notices, right? Yeah. And I was like, good point. So that was when I saw that I introduced myself to her and I was like I'll, I'm going to go to Bolivia and and search out that story and so um and it's actually kind of even funnier because I was even heading through Bolivia I didn't actually see her first and I was heading through Bolivia to go to Peru to find an ayahuasquero and I just bumped into a, a journalist that worked for Narco News and he he told me about, you know, all these connections and I can do this story. And I was like, you know, I sat down with myself and my girlfriend at the time and I was like, I need to do this story or else I will never live with myself. And so I gave up going to see the iOS Garrow and uh, turned back and ended up making this feature film that was, you know, the best thing I've ever done. So mm. it's definitely just following the scene where it took me. Tell us a little bit about uh, some of the other content in the, in the movie and, uh, um, and also, you know, I, I was thinking of, um, let's see here, Coca de, the subtitle is uh, Coca Democracy and Rebellion in, in Bolivia, and I think you have a channel for it on uh, on uh, GNN, right, .tv? Well, yeah, there was a couple. It's We used to have, uh, you know, I need to get it up. I don't know if it's the full movies on the web anywhere. I need to do that. Um, and we used to have a bunch more on our site, but we've taken our site down for a bit, the the data world data site, but uh, it's, I mean, it's very much about, it was a very, very dense, uh, politicized film about uh, coca and the coca wars, and ultimately, was not even about the coca, it's about, you know, the oil under the earth, and the coca was just really a pretext, and um, it was quite an amazing film, because I spent a lot of time with the coca farmers, this is before Evo, Evo Morales won the presidency, so I got to I- interview Evo Morales and interview all these coca farmers and um, you know it was, I even got into the US embassy and interviewed the, the director of the US aid there and uh, the, it was quite a even got into a I somehow managed to get into one of the Bolivian military helicopters and go video them eradicating coca and really so it was quite a you know basically with me just lying and saying I was a journalist <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
uh, managed to get quite a quite a story, and it's you know no one was covering the story at that point in that way, and then uh, you know a few years or a couple of years later, uh, Eva wins the election, so it was quite uh, uh, quite amazing to see that all turn around that way. Do Do you think it's um, better down there today? Ah, uh, yeah, it's better. I mean, there's obviously we can be critical of Evo and all sorts of things, but it is it's way better. Um, I have a lot of hope for South America. I mean, um, it's quite uh, the social movements there are incredibly inspiring and powerful, and the people have been through a lot, and they're still, you know, organizing and resisting in different ways. And uh, you know, the the rise of the the Incan nation seems to be happening. So. Um, Uh, and they, they've got the plants behind them. That's the thing. Well, I think that's when I realized when I was like, you're not going to beat these people. They have coca behind them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. it, was, uh, it was quite uh, amazing to see the relationship with the land. Would you say that kind of the main perpetrators here, at least on the surface, if we talk about that, uh, would be the uh, the U.S. or at least the, the interest in, yeah. you know, coca and, and, and actually, you know, creating... Uh, cocaine and and the 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 whole illegal drug market thing going on, but in in America in general, would you say the U.S. are are behind it, or you know rogue elements we should say within the U.S. Right? Yeah, I mean I don't even know. I mean, well, with the cocaine, I'm sure you know we all know about U.S. Uh, government implications with uh, cocaine trading and stuff like that, and it's quite clear that you know there's something going on there uh, with the facilitating of the opening of the cocaine routes and stuff like that. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, and the U.S. government—it was quite clear policy to be uh, uh, committing these atrocities in, in Bolivia. So, uh, and U.S., you know, like U.S. aid, uh, which is there supposedly to help uh, the develop their economy, is clearly there to uh, destroy their economy. Hmm. And so, and it's funny because I interviewed the head of the U.S. aid, and I think she thought, well, she thought I was American because I was with an American when we got in, and. And we asked about free trade, and she was she's like, oh no no, we wouldn't get it. we wouldn't allow this to ever get in the way of, you know, our trade. And you know, you don't hear that outside of the states because they're not supposed to say that. Right. <laughs> But they basically said it right to me. They're like, yeah, you know, we'll make sure that this doesn't interfere with American trade, and and it goes totally counter to the rhetoric of free trade. So it was very um, revealing to hear that. Hmm. Well, I mean, what's your perspective on? Uh Let's t- let's take the idea of the North American Union going on. Yeah. I mean, that's okay. That that still leaves out uh, South American Union, but we know that they've set up that as a pretext of uh, th- that it's been set up now, basically. And I don't know if it's been ratified by all nations down there. I'm not sure. But uh, this this came to me just a couple of months ago. I think I have no idea. It, it was obvious when you think about it because we have all these different unions going on around the world. So it kind of uh, was obvious at that point. But um, what's your take on, on North American Union, and what, would you say that that's that would be a better thing? Canada, U.S., and Mexico going together as one? You know what? Um, it's interesting because Winnipeg, where I'm from, actually plays a significant role in that North American Union. Our our government and our um, is actually very active in the development of the, the trade corridor. So the actual the trade corridor that would go through the North American Union, we would be one of the inland portals. And our, we have a port of Churchill up in it's up in the Hudson Bay, uh, north of our province. And the whole plan would be then to import cheap Chinese and Indian goods. Yes. We'd go through Russia to the port of Churchill through Winnipeg. We'd probably become the new border or customs to go in, and then into the states and into the heartland and and Texas and stuff. So I, I'm actually quite aware of all that. And um, and you know. I, it definitely, it's happening, and they're definitely doing it. And they definitely may not have the best intentions on doing it. Um, I, I just really believe that you know all this, 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 uh, these new world order kind of machinations and changes. Uh, people doing them definitely don't have their best intentions, or they, maybe they think they do, but it doesn't come across that way. Yes. And it's just what they think. But the thing is, I, I ultimately think it's there's a greater plan unfolding, and that that plan will then be superseded by whatever creator or the greater forces are bringing us to. So I'm not really too fearful of the North American Union. I mean, I always say I'm, I hate borders myself, right? Yes. You know, and I have no problem getting rid of borders. It's just, you know, you look at who's the ones doing it and you, right. there's reason to fear. You're like, well, why do these guys want this? And so it's obviously they have this dream of some 